Well, good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see you. Do come in and grab a seat if you're still just uh, coming through the door. Hope you've enjoyed your bacon sandwiches this morning uh, as we come together today to celebrate Father's Day, uh, a day where we celebrate fathering, we celebrate fathers. Uh, maybe we, uh, we think back to fathers who we've lost, and that's uh, maybe a little more poignant. Uh, and we, we come together to know that we have a good father don't we? A good father in heaven who is the example of fathering uh, and who we look to uh, as we worship. It's great uh, just to be able to tell you some good news about some families of some of our uh, families in the church who have been a little bit extended over the last few days. Uh, Meryl and Peter Gwillem uh, have had Etta Sylvie uh, all going well there, which is lovely. Isn't that a gorgeous picture? Just... Great. Uh, we've also had Margot Lillian, um, who is born to Chantel and Ryan Jennings. Uh, Chantel is the daughter of Sue and Hans Smith, so we celebrate alongside them. Another gorgeous picture. Uh, just, just so lovely. Uh, and now we have a name as well. Uh, for Logan James, uh, who is born to Beth and Christian Parsons. Uh, Beth being the daughter of Tim and Heather Breed. So we celebrate alongside them as well. Isn't that lovely? Just so nice. And uh, some new fathers uh, developing there as well, which is nice to celebrate. Let's set our hearts and minds on worship. Uh, we're going to be focusing in a little bit later on on Isaiah. Uh, Tim Goodall is coming to, to help us to think about what real worship is uh, as we study further in Isaiah. Has anyone read those chapters I asked you to read? That's really good to see. We're trying to work through the whole book, and we've got selected scriptures, uh, so it's good to see that some of you have been reading that. But let's pray, and then Matt is going to lead us in worship. Father God, we thank you so much that we can draw together as church family. We thank you uh, that you love us and want the best for us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are present right here amongst us this morning. And we look to you. May we encounter you. May we be built up. May we be strengthened as we celebrate who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matt. Amen. I'm really excited for this sermon to hear about real worship. So let's stand, if we're able, and let's worship our awesome God, shall we? Let's sing, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Your 
power of love as we sing holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. Sing that one more time, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God, you are holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power.
come lift up his name with the sound of singing lift up his name with all the earth lift up your voice worthy to be praised oh lift up his name the sound of singing lift up his name with all the earth lift up your voice and give him glory for he is worthy to be praised for he up your name because you are holy and I thank you Lord that we can celebrate our fathers today and although sometimes fathers struggle you are the ultimate father and nothing is too big for you we're going to sing about that now as we sing our kids song there is nothing too big for his power and I think we have some actions which means you can all watch and join in You guys ready? I'll take that as a yes. Let's do it. One, two, three, four. Nothing's too big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too little, little for his care. Nothing's too big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too for his care, nothing's too big, big, big for his power, nothing's too insuancy for his care, nothing's too big, big, big for his power, nothing's too teeny weeny for his care. He is the God of the big, the God of the little, God of the stuff, somewhere in the middle, King of the moving mountains, loves you. Too big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too little, little for his care. Nothing's too big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too little, little for his care. Big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too itsy witsy for his care. Nothing's too big, big, big for his power. Nothing's too teeny weeny for his care. He is the God of the big. the 
God. He is the God of the big, God of the little, God of the stuff somewhere in the middle. King of the moving mountains, loves you more than you will ever know. Whoa, -oh, it's time for the improv. Well done, guys. Oh, so everybody take a well-earned seat. Guys, well done. Go and sit down for me. We'll work on the improv. <laughs> okay, so this morning, um, we're going to do a little something different before our children and our young people head off to our group. So I don't know if you've noticed around the room, there's a few things that aren't normally here today. So on the wall over here... Uh, we've got some butterflies, we've got some fish on a net over here, and we've got some chains on a cross just behind me. And on Monday, we ha had an amazing morning with the Year 3 children from uh, Nunnerywood Primary, which is where Janet is a teacher. Um, so we had all her crew over here, and they came and did a creative prayer morning. So we did lots and lots of different activities to help them engage in ways that they can pray at home. Um, and their whole topic was about what does Jesus want the world to look like? And we were unpacking that with them. Um, so our butterflies over here are all their prayers to see change, to see transformation in the world. Their prayers on their fish are for the names of their closest friends who they're going to pray for and promise to be a really good friend to. And these ones that are behind us are um, chains, things that they want to see broken in their lives like war and rubbish stuff like that. So we're going to add um, our own creative prayers to these this morning. So on your chair when you came in, hopefully, if Florrie did a really good job, you should have one of these little black squares. If you haven't, I've got several hundred here, so please come and grab one uh, if you need one. So hopefully you've got one of these. And then somewhere on the end of your rows, there should be a little pile of these like scratchy pen things. So pass those down your row. There should be enough for everyone. Yeah, grab some more. Guys, kids in the corner, if you need some extras, because I know you've already been creating beautiful things on these, come and grab another one. There we go, there's some extras there. So once you've got your little piece of black paper and your scratchy thing, we are going to use these to do some prayers this morning. You got one? There's a spare scratcher. Okay, so what we're going to do this morning is we are going to take this opportunity to pray for some of the men in our lives. So that might be a dad, that might be a father figure, this might be a best friend, it might be your child, it can be anybody you like, but we're going to focus particularly on the men in our lives this morning. And what I would like you to do is write the name of that man on your piece of scratch card. If you haven't seen these before, you just use it like a paper and a pencil, but it's much more exciting than just writing on normal paper. Okay, so you just scratch onto it and it just writes like a normal pencil. So what you can do with these is you've got two choices. You can write a few names on here and then when you take it home with you, you can pop it on your fridge or wherever and you can keep praying for those people or you can write your whole prayer on here. If that is a really difficult thing this morning to identify a man in your life that you would like to pray for, we can pray a prayer of thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father, um, who is there for us through all of these days that can feel a bit difficult when we celebrate people in our lives. And sometimes if they're not there anymore, or that father figure in your life was a difficult person for you to get on with, then pray a prayer of thanksgiving that our Heavenly Father is perfect and is everything that we need. So we're just going to pop some music on. Guys, you can do this as well over in the corner. And we're just going to take a couple of minutes, just write a prayer um, for somebody in your life who you'd like to thank God for.
Huxley's drawing his daddy. He's got a very detailed Tottenham shirt on his piece of scratch art. <laughs> okay, so if you haven't quite finished, don't worry, you can carry on with those. Um, you can take them home with you, pop them on your fridge, pop them somewhere where you can see them. Remind yourselves to pray for those men in your lives or to thank God that he is the ultimately heavenly father. Um, let's pray for those um, just before I say something else. So hold those prayers in your hand. In fact, you know what? Stand up with your with your pieces of paper, if you're able, stand up. And we're gonna pray our prayers out loud together, okay? No one's listening to you, don't be shy about it, only God is listening to you, okay? So let's pray for these together. Father God, we thank you for... Father, we thank you that you are the ultimate heavenly Father, that you hold us uh, underneath your wings, that you care for us, that you have great plans for us, and that you'll never let us go. Amen. So just before um, we send our children and young people out to their groups, if you're new here this morning, we've got groups for children age one, right up to 14. If you're not sure where you're going, you can meet me on the landing in a second. But just before we do that, I'm going to invite Tim Parker to join me right on cue. Well done, Tim. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I think there might be a photograph to show if uh, Tim's awake at the back. Um, because um, it's not past uh, someone's attention that he's been here for 10 years. And uh, he posted uh, this on Facebook. Uh, it is Andy. Um, <laughs> um, we'll put that down to 10 years of uh, being with us. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like Tim to come forward now, and uh, Rebecca, could you jump into the music cupboard? Um, and Andy <laughs> and Ruth, could you come up on stage? Yes, and Ruth, please. <laughs> Ruth, Andy wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Yeah, just, just to acknowledge the fact, really, that Andy's been with us for 10 years. Um, for some people, they might say, 10 years, goodness me. But I, actually, it feels like a long time for me. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, <laughs> as, as a church, we've been through quite a few, quite a few seasons since Andy's been with us. Some, some really high points, uh, some points that weren't quite so high. Um, but you really acknowledge um, Andy and Ruth's faithfulness and their true service, and uh, we're really grateful for it. And uh, Tim has a little gift for, to remember it by. You can, yes, open it now if you like. Yeah, and while you're opening it, uh, something for Ruth. Yes, because we, we appreciate everything they both do for us. Um, so the big unveil. <laughs> 
Okay, so if you are aged between 1 and 14, you can head out now. Um, if your children are at year 4 and under, if you can just bring them out just onto the landing and we'll make sure we've got them signed in. If they're older than that, they can just disappear down to the youth lounge. So just as they go, Father, we thank you for these guys. We thank you for their heart to follow you. We thank you for their, um, their want to know more about you and to learn more about you. And we are just so excited to see how you are impacting their daily walk, Lord. And we are just excited to see what adventures you've got in store for them. Amen. Oh, just, just to start off. Are we on? There we go. Just to start off with saying thank, thank you so much for that. It was really unexpected and um, uh, a real blessing to us. And certainly been reflecting over these uh, just last few days, about 10 years of being here, uh, and just how that's been, I don't know, the most blessed, uh, the most rigorous, testing, joyous, all sorts of things, 10 years of our lives, really. Miriam coming along halfway through those years, and uh, just, just amazing years, uh, and so grateful to be part of this church family. I know not every minister can say that they absolutely love the church that they're in, and I feel so blessed to be able to say that, uh, and uh, have always felt that. Anyway, moving on before I get emotional. Um, got a number of things going on in the life of the church, as I always say. Just to say a big thank you to, uh, to Bob and Jean Fraser and to Rebecca and to Al for making the, ba ba uh, the bacon sandwiches happen this morning. That was really nice. Really enjoyed that. Um, good to have more social time together as well. Uh, the staff team are going on a retreat day on uh, Friday, so the building is going to be closed so that everybody who, uh, from the team who can come um, will be there and we can have some special time together praying. Uh, we've got James Martin coming from uh, Pershaw Baptist Church to spend a little bit of time with us in the morning uh, and uh, bring a bit of a word to us and encourage us, which will be great. And we're just going to spend some time really digging in and praying and building the staff team up, which I think is uh, important. They work so hard for the church here. So great to be able to spend some time together. Uh, so that's on Friday the 23rd. On the 28th of June, it is our ACM. So members, please have that in your diary. Please make sure that you're here. An important day for us to gather. And as part of that meeting, uh, we will be uh, electing a new uh, church leader. There is one space this year. Uh, and we have one person standing. Uh, and that is uh, Matt Davis is standing for election as a church leader, uh, which is exciting. So just to flag that up. Uh, we need to let you know that the two Sundays before the meeting. Uh, we have a Thanksgiving service coming up for all that God has done in the life of the church um, throughout the last year. At the ACM, we always do a review of the year and name all the things that God has done and celebrate those things. And we thought it would be, as a leadership team, we thought it would be a really good idea this year to make a little bit more of that, to bring that into our Sunday service, the following Sunday after the ACM, so that's the 2nd of July, uh, and to celebrate, to name those things, uh, to focus upon giving thanks to God for all that he has done for us individually as a church family, those sorts of things, uh, and know how good he is. And as part of that, we felt it would be great to take up a special Thanksgiving offering uh, for what God wants to do here at St. Peter's in the coming year, uh, and to, to take a one-time offering as we celebrate all that's been accomplished and our hopes for the future. Uh, so just to give you, uh, you know, notice about that, really, that we're going to be doing that on the 2nd of July, uh, and we hope that we can really bless God by by reflecting on what is done and looking towards the future. After the service that morning, we're going to have a uh, bring and share uh, lunch uh, in the lower hall together as a church family, and we'll give you more details about how to participate in that closer to the time. But do keep that in your diary. Uh, Lydia Repton is uh, leading the virtual encounter. This, so this is a, an online thing where she gathers people here, but they watch online, connect online, for Healed for Life, uh, which is a healing retreat. Uh, some people can go in person, and others will be here as a hub, uh, and uh, Lydia is leading that hub, and that is on the, second, uh, on the 7th and 8th of July. If you're interested in that, please let us know or speak to Lydia, send her an email. Uh, she would love to hear from you, or you can book up through Church Beat, I believe. Foundations course is coming up on the 10th of July, so if you're interested in baptism and membership, come and have a word with me and we can get you signed up for that. Uh, it'd be great to talk to you around anything uh, to do with baptism and membership. 
Uh, the big church festival, uh, Matt and Eleanor on Frontline are looking at going to that next year. And if you book really early, you get a really good discount. Um, and so if anyone is interested in going along uh, and having a great time down there in Sussex, uh, let them know as soon as possible, uh, but certainly by the end of July so that they can get that booked in and uh, make, make use of that potential discount. Uh, there, there is a new recycling center just by the lift on the landing um, for things that are maybe not so easily recyclable, like batteries uh, and blister packs, you know, the medical packs that you get, like paracetamol in and that sort of thing. If you've got those and you want to recycle them, they're not generally easily recyclable, but we're collecting them here and then taking them on to the places where do, they do recycle them. So have a look at the top of the stairs for the things that we've got there, but we we'll encourage you uh, to bring your batteries and uh, blister packs uh, in to the little bins by the lift there. I also just want to flag up that we have a prayer room in the building. You may or may not know that, but we have a prayer room in the building just inside the front, front door. To the right is room five, and we use that as a prayer space. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice little room. We're keeping it really nicely. We've just bought a little bit of new artwork to go in there. Please do make use of that if you would like to. On that theme of prayer, I'm going to ask uh, Alison to come uh, and lead us in our prayer time this morning. Thank you so much, Alison. Good morning, church. Uh, And hello to all those watching online as well. <clears throat> now, I feel a bit, li little bit like the children earlier. I, get, I still get stage fright. I don't like getting up here and speaking. But, uh, and to sort of ease me in, you probably know by now that I like to give a little prelude to our prayer time about prayer. So, did you know this? If we ask anything according to God's will... He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have what we've asked of him. So put your hand up if you think this is true. Good, good, good. Leave it up if you think this is in the Bible. Okay, good, good. And keep it up if you know chapter and verse. <laughs> oh, well done. Come on, shout it out. Yeah, 1 John 5, 14 to 15. So everybody who initially raised their hand, knowing the truth is enough. Knowing the verses in the Bible is great, and knowing chapter and verse is excellent, but knowing the truth is enough. So praying in accordance with God's will is powerful, and praying with Scripture is wonderful. Now, sometimes we know the truth through scripture, in our own words. It's true, isn't it? We don't always know exactly what it says in the Bible. We kind of know the sentiment of it. And that's good too, to use what we know about the truth of God to pray. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes we know it as song. We know the truth as song. And I wanted to share with you today that I sometimes pray with the songs that I know. And at times, the words of the song are easier to remember than the scripture. And the truth remains just the same. So maybe you already do this too. But just in case it was helpful, I thought I would share that. So now to our prayers. In case you missed it, it's Father's Day. <laughs> and whether your experience of having a father or being a father is good or bad or non-existent, I think it's probably the case that most of you here know that you have a Father in Heaven. If you don't know, or you're not sure, come and find me after the service and we can have a lovely chat. So we're going to start our prayers with giving thanks for the love of our Heavenly Father, and then we'll move on to praying for the fathers in our, and grandfathers and father figures in our church family, especially those with young, fam young children. And that's not to be uncaring about all the other Father Day scenarios, but I have to pray where the Lord has led me. Um, once we've prayed, I'm going to remind you about a couple of things to pray for in the week. So now, if we're sitting comfortably, 
Let us pray. Father God, how great is the love that you have lavished on us. Lavished. What a wonderful word. It sounds, it's like it sounds. It's generous and warm and luxurious even. Your love is rich and extravagant. So great is this love that you have made us your children. We are children of God. You adopted us, sons and daughters of the most loving father ever, and made us part of your family. How safe we are in your everlasting arms. Your love is amazing. It's steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath our feet. Your love is a mystery. And as you gently lift us, when we're surrounded by cares, your love carries us. Hallelujah. Your love is deep, vast, beyond all measure. Your love is sacrificial. You gave up your only son, Jesus, to make me a wretch, your treasure. And when I ask myself how deep this love is, because I really need to know, you give me the words from a Bee Gees song. We're living in a sad, mad world full of fools and bad news that breaks us down. Don't we know that this week? But I believe in you, and you know the door to my very soul. You're the light in my darkest hour, and you're my saviour when I fall. So this is what love looks like. You've showed us. And now uh, we pray for fathers everywhere and in all situations, but particularly those in this church family. Lord, I don't know what it's like to be a father, but I do know what it's like to have a father, a really good earthly father and a wonderfully heavenly father, and I am blessed. So, Father, I pray for fathers and father figures that they will love the children in their care with your love, steady and unchanging, in a way that they will be confident, the children will be confident to come to them at all times with their joys and news about their day and when they feel overwhelmed or sad and troubled. May fathers be available. Help them not to be too busy or distracted to spend time with their children. May there never be anything more important than being with them and listening to them. I pray for fathers as providers for their family, that they will know that you are their provider so that they can provide for their family. Help fathers everywhere to manage their time and effort as provider. And may they never love their job more than their family, even when family responsibilities are sometimes repetitive and not that exciting. I pray for time off and time out for all fathers, and particularly those of young children, so that they can recover and reset. Fun times with other blokes and fellowship too. And may all fathers, father figures and grandfathers in this church family know you well, and may you be their strength and shield and their guide at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. So through the week, I'd like you to also pray for the CYF missional community, I guess it is now. Um, we had, had rather hoped to be appointing a new member of staff, but we didn't get any applicants. So please um, just keep that ministry in a missional community in your prayers. Um, pray for Rebecca. She's probably a little disappointed. Um, thank you for all the wonderful volunteers who step up and serve in this area. And just pray that we would just find God's way in this. He obviously has a better plan or better timing. And pray also for the staff retreat coming up this week. Um, may they just really bond together well and um, be more unified, even more than they already are. And may they be refreshed. 
And um, also, could you pray for Jean-Jacques and Selena? Um, they're part of our online community. They've had COVID and other members of their family also. And Selena has been in the emergency room. We, we don't know them, but they kind of know us. So <laughs> um, I bring them to you for your prayers this week. Thank you. Let's continue in worship and in prayer as we sing King of Kings, Majesty. Please stand if you're able.
Right. Okay, so this is the second um, week in our series on Isaiah, uh, a big, chunky book of prophecy in the Old Testament. Last week, Andy introduced the book and gave us a lot of background about the political situation, the geographical situation, and a bit of background about Isaiah himself. Um, I have to say, Andy, I also love Dante's Peak. Um, In fact, I do have a confession. During lockdown, uh, Dawn and I watched as many disaster movies as we possibly could find on various streaming services. Some of them were really B-movies, but they were great. But um, the the point of Dante Speak is that the scientist in that movie is giving a warning which nobody heeds, and that that was the point. Um, So Andy finished with three points. Um telling us from Isaiah chapter 1 that God's message brings correction, brings discipline, it demands wholeheartedness, and it gives hope. God's word always gives hope. So it's really no different this week. So I could stop there, really, couldn't I? (laughs) Hopefully, um, you've read chapters 2 to 5. I know lots of you have. Um, Can I just recommend uh, this book by Phil Moore, Straight to the Heart of Isaiah. It's part of a series called Straight to the Heart of, which is so good, Rod Giles has bought the whole set. (laughs) Okay, I can thoroughly recommend these. I've used these for, um, I've got a beginning to build up my own collection of these. And they're simple, straightforward, and they're learned as well, particularly the footnotes. So they are, at any level, these are fantastic books. I'll briefly refer to uh, something he says later on. Uh, Before we do that, though, um, I'm going to ask Dawn to read um, God's Word for us today. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah's Commission. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces... With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken, sorry, which he'd taken from the altar. As he touched my mouth, he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and the oak leaf stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. This is God's word to us this morning. Thank you, Dawn. Um, If you're new here this morning, I would just point out, um, if you're confused, that there are several Tims knocking about. I'm just just one of them. You've already seen two. Okay. So this morning we're going to look at the passage in some detail, and then I want to return to one or two themes uh, in more depth towards the end. In particular, I want to look at the link between the holiness of God, and our Christian worship. 
You may also note in passing how important a foundation the prophecies of Isaiah are to the New Testament. And this won't be the last time you notice this in our preaching series. So in case you missed it last week, here's a bit of background. Isaiah was from a privileged background, and he had access to the king. He started prophesying before King Isaiah died, which was in 740 BC. He continued ministering until around 681 BC, when it's believed he was executed. The tradition is that it was actually sawn in half, which isn't very nice. Um, there's a mention of that, actually, in the Hebrews chapter of um, Heroes of the Bible, he Hebrews chapter 11. So much of the first part of this collection of prophecies relates to events during his lifetime. From chapter 40 onwards, he's looking further into the future. To put it simply, the first half of the book of Isaiah is warnings to the people of Jerusalem and Judea, the southern kingdom of what had been a united Israel in the time of David and Solomon. The second half from chapter 40 contains, contains messages of comfort and of hope, not least chapter uh, 53, which foretells a suffering servant, which was, of course, fulfilled in Jesus 750 years later. Many scholars over the last 150 years or so have concluded that these later prophecies couldn't have been written by Isaiah at all. Um, that comes down to a lack of belief in predictive prophecy, I suppose. Um, but these were the prophecies of those who continued Isaiah's ministry in later times. However, for me, there is no strong enough reason to doubt that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah couldn't have written down all these prophecies in the book that bears his name. Incidentally, some of the oldest parts of the Old Testament that remain to us, that survive, are copies of Isaiah, uh, found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 1940s, including a complete copy of Isaiah dating to about 150 BC. So the book of Isaiah is often seen um, not only as the fifth gospel, as Andy mentioned last week, but also like the Bible in miniature, with the first part representing the Old Testament and the second part from chapter 40 onward re representing the New Testament. Okay, so who was King Isaiah? <clears throat> he was also known as Amaziah, and he reigned from 792 BC until his death in 740 BC. He was generally seen as a good king, a strong leader, but towards the end of his reign, he tried to burn incense in the temple, a rite reserved for the priests, who were specially consecrated for that purpose. He tried to step into the role of king and priest, a role reserved for the Messiah alone. He angrily tried to continue despite opposition from the priests, and as a result, and you can read this in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 26, he developed leprosy and had to live away from the palace for the remaining 10 years or so of his life. His son, Jothan, ruled in his place. So let's look at Isaiah's vision uh, in more detail. If chapters 1 to 5, that most of you have read, um, predate chapter 6, so assume that these cr um, prophecies are all in chronological order, then this is like a reboot, or maybe the end of Isaiah's apprenticeship as a prophet. It's his formal commissioning, giving him the responsibility from now on to proclaim God's word to the people. So Isaiah 6 verse 1 firmly places this vision in a specific time in history, 740 BC. That's 2,773 years ago, if your maths is as slow as mine. So what Isaiah sees is the king, the Lord. He doesn't see Isaiah. He doesn't see um, Jotham. But he sees the Lord God upon his heavenly throne. Isaiah is reminded that it's not Isaiah or his son who's in charge of Israel, or Judah, but the sovereign God of the heavens. We aren't specifically told if this vision takes place in the temple itself or whether Isaiah has a vision of a heavenly temple. It could be either. Regardless, there is heavenly worship 
going on. Seraphs, a type of angel, are worshipping their creator. We don't know how many. It could be two. It could be a whole host. Seraphs, found only here in the Bible, are burning ones. That's what we think the word seraph means. The majesty, awe, and holiness of God is so great they cannot look God in the face. This is why they have to cover their eyes with a pair of wings. You may recall that John has a similar vision uh, in Revelation chapter 4. The heavenly throne is again ablaze with light and with color. There were four living creatures, each also with six wings. They worshipped him on, who is on the throne, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. In both Isaiah and in Revelation, the eternal cry around God's throne is holy, holy, holy. This particular phrase, um, in theological terms, has acquired the epithet, the ter sanctus. If you're into Latin, you'll realize that that means thrice holy. Okay, so if you hear the word ter sanctus, that's what it means. Holy, holy, holy. This could be significant for two reasons. Having three holies. Looking back through our Christian lens, the seraphim, seraphim being plural for seraph in Hebrew, could be saying holy to each person of the Trinity. Holy to God the Father. Holy to Jesus. Holy to the Holy Spirit. That, that's the mystery of the three-in-oneness of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this sort of fits in with the veiled theme of Isaiah as being a fifth gospel. Saying holy three times could also be for huge emphasis. It's referring to the unsurpassable purity of God's holiness. I have mentioned before that in Hebrew, not that I study Hebrew because I don't, um, a phrase like King of Kings that we often sing, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, King of Kings is a superlative. And I suppose what it really means is something like the most kingiest of all kings ever, if that is a phrase. So the inner sanctum of the temple in Jerusalem is described as the holy of holies, i.e. the most holy place, not just in the temple, but on the earth. So the suggestion is that by repeating holy three times, or kadosh in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, the angels are ascribing to God the ultimate in holiness and purity. This must be his defining characteristic if it's the basis of all their worship. So, Phil Moore, in his really useful little book that I can't stop recommending highly enough, um, tells us that this part of Isaiah's prophecies show us, and he puts them under a heading, of God is holier than you think. God is holier than you think. So how, however you imagine God is holy, well, it's way beyond that. It's way beyond that. He says God isn't just kadosh, and he isn't even kadosh, kadosh. He is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. He is far holier than any human language can describe. I wonder maybe if we don't realize that when we're worshiping together. We don't fully appreciate who we worship. We don't fully appreciate the huge ultimate holiness of our God. I'm not saying it's wrong to treat God as Father in our worship and acknowledge the intimacy that we have with God in our worship. But it's also sometimes we're maybe in danger of losing that awe and wonder. I want to return to the theme of holiness a little bit later on. So back to Isaiah. So Isaiah uh, realizes his complete unworthiness before the throne of God. He knows that when Moses asked to see the glory of God, Moses was told in Exodus chapter 33, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and 
proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. This is why Isaiah is terrified. However, God has mercy on Moses in this situation, and he puts Moses into the cleft of a rock and covers it with his hand until he has passed. So Isaiah is terrified that he's going to die. Um, what you can see on the screen um, have been two images of what the heavenly vision might have been. The first one was by somebody professional. Uh, this one I did in a soul food um, once. I just couldn't give expression to what I thought the holiness of God was like. Um, you probably can't see it, but there's a spelling mistake in there. Please don't look for it. <laughs> there's actually, there's actually a, a letter missing. So the quotation there is, um, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then from Psalm 27, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to seek him in his temple. Um, can I encourage you to express your worship, not just in words and in song, but in other uh, art forms as well? So, Isaiah is terrified he's going to die. A bit irreverently, maybe a bit flippantly, I imagined it like Dorothy and her companions meeting the Wizard of Oz. I mean, that is, that's pretty terrifying. Um, but if you'll forgive that comparison... Um, I think Isaiah must have felt that sort of terror, but infinitely more serious and infinitely more awesome. Faced with this vision of purity and holiness of God, he is made powerfully aware of his sinfulness. Isaiah feels utterly broken and laid bare. So a seraph touches Isaiah's lips with a red-hot coal. This is significant to Isaiah, as fiery coals were taken into the temple on the Day of Atonement, one of the Jewish festivals, when sacrifices were made to pay for people's sin. Isaiah would have recognized this. And so this is why the angel says that his guilt and sin have been taken away. He is now able to be confident before the throne of God. The question is asked, whom shall I send? This is a rhetorical question, really, because as far as we know, Isaiah is the only human being there. But this is not a command or a demand. It's actually an invitation. God isn't forcing Isaiah. He doesn't force anyone. But he's looking for people willing to do his work, no matter how strange it may appear. And it does seem strange because Isaiah is asked to preach a message that's almost an anti-message. Perhaps in, it's in the spirit of irony. It's saying, if you don't listen, then disaster will fall upon the land and only a remnant will remain. Don't dare listen and repent or you'll be in danger of understanding God and being healed. That's how it comes across to me. However, there is a flicker of hope in this message. There's always Hope in God's word. From the remnant, the stump of the oak or the terebinth tree, a new nation will grow. The terebinth tree, by the way, I had to look it up, uh, is a small Mediterranean tree that's very hardy. It produces a sort of turpentine, which has medicinal properties. The fruit can be roasted to form a type of coffee. Its oil can be used for soap, and the resin can be used as a wine preservative. What a useful plant. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> so the importance of this message, and you probably recognize it, you will be hearing but never understanding, was understood by Jesus. Jesus is reported as quoting this passage in all four Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the context of the parable of the sower. Why do you speak in parables? That's little illustrative stories with spiritual meaning an application behind them. Why do you speak in parables, Jesus was asked. Jesus replies by quoting this passage from Isaiah. 
which we uh, Dawn read for us. But he then goes on to say, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you did, but did not see and long to hear what you, did, you heard, but did not hear it. He then goes on to explain the parable of the sower to his disciples. There is always hope Always understanding if you seek God fully. Jesus quotes it again in John's Gospel during Holy Week. And the Apostle Paul also quotes it when he's preaching under guard um, to the people in Rome. But he added to its significance by saying, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, not just to Jews. So the Gentiles are non-Jews. And they will listen. So this prophecy actually has a double fulfillment. A fulfillment in Isaiah's time, because he wasn't universally listened to. Prophets generally aren't. Um, and it had this fulfillment in the time of uh, Jesus Christ on earth and the early church. In fact, you could still say it's relevant today. It's still relevant today. When you look at the size of the church in our nation, 3 to 5% of the population are believers. We, we could still apply that today. You might recall from the start of this sermon that the title is Real Worship. And might be wondering where that's disappeared to. Well, I mentioned we've returned to look at God's holiness, and this is where it comes in. So what do holy and holiness mean? Well, I could be a bit teachery and say, holiness is an abstract noun formed from holy, which is an adjective. Did you find that helpful? No. <laughs> the word holy is used a lot in the Bible, mainly about God and about places and rituals surrounding worship. In the law given to Moses for the Israelites, God says, be holy for I am holy. God's holiness is absolute perfection and purity, love, mercy, and grace. God is described as love by uh, the Apostle John in one of his letters to the churches. How can we, as imperfect, wrongdoing human beings, dare to approach this awesome, powerful, creator God, who is so holy, so absolutely perfect, loving and merciful, that even the great heroes of the Bible, such as Moses and Isaiah, and the angels around God's throne cannot look upon him. It's no wonder, really, that Isaiah was broken in the presence of God. How does the word holy, then, apply to us? People, objects, and places described as holy are people, places, and things in the Bible which have been set apart for God. That's what holiness means. It means being set apart for God. And set apart from, the, from sin and the ways of the world. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard the phrase, Holy Joe, or holier than thou, um, which are intended as derogatory terms for someone who is pious or religious. They suggest someone who thinks they are better than we are, because they go to church, or they say their prayers. But I think this shows a lack of understanding of what holiness is or being holy, really is. We are holy, sanctified is another word, by being set apart for God. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, here's a bit of Greek, so I don't want to disappoint you, um, the words for holy, which is hagios, and the word for saints, which is hagioi, um, are virtually the same word. They're very closely related. Saints are not just holy people in the past, heroes of the faith that we might read about, the Bible describes us as saints too. Holy people set apart for God. Peter says we are a holy nation. When we discover just how much God loves us and that God is calling us, we choose, like Isaiah, to be set apart for him. Isaiah made a choice. He accepted God's invitation. We want to be more like Jesus and strive, if that's the right word, to become more like him every day. 
It's a lifelong process. We aren't made perfect or holy straight away. I'm sure one or two of you might have realized that. I've certainly realized that. It's not like the fairy godmother transforming Cinderella in an instant. Bippity boppity boo. Well, it's not, and it is. Let me explain. God does not change. The author of the letter to Hebrews in 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. James writes in his letter that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Therefore, God is as still as holy as he ever was and ever will be. What is our response to this as we worship? Should we fall on our knees? Are we aware of the awesomeness of God? Do we feel laid bare and utterly unworthy? Well, I don't want to discourage you, so I'm not going to leave it there. We do have a legitimate way into God's presence. We've talked of one of the defining characteristics of God as love. Perhaps the most quoted Bible verse ever is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that was God's plan. He sent his Son Jesus to die in place of us for all our sins. Jesus is plan A. There is no plan B. Under Jewish law, sacrifice of sins had to be made at least once a year. People didn't have direct access to God. Only the priests could have access to God. And only one of them, once a year, to enter into the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died for us, that separation was ended. No more sacrifices were needed. Jesus was the final, full once for all time, sacrifice for us. So when we approach God the Father because of our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are counted as holy. We are counted as holy. That's our Cinderella moment. That's our bippity boppity boo. Even though we are and continue to be a work in progress, the writer to the Hebrews puts it like this. For by one sacrifice, he has, past tense, made perfect forever all those, thus, who are being made holy. That's a continuous process. So it is and it isn't. Okay. That's the it's not and it is. So our attitude in worship needs to be a combination of awe and reverence at God's holiness. Fully aware of our own unworthiness, but with gratitude at what he's done for us through Jesus Christ and confidence of God's love for us. And we return that love to our Heavenly Father as we worship. Paul wrote to the Ephesians saying, in Jesus Christ our Lord and through faith in him, we, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Charles Wesley wrote this line in his most well-known hymn. He said, Bold, I approach the eternal throne. It's because of our faith in Jesus that we're able to do this when we worship and when we pray. So, as the band return, we're going to continue worshipping in just a moment. But be very aware of who it is that we are worshipping. Know that he is holy and that we are called to be holy set apart for him too. Peter says in his first letter, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Paul says to the Roman church, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper 
worship. This is your real worship. Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's not a church thing. It's not a Sunday thing. It's an every day of our lives thing. That's the challenge of real worship that I want to leave with you. And as we worship now, I want us to consider the invitation to Isaiah. Whom shall I send? What is our Father in heaven asking us to do? What are we being invited to join in with? Maybe it's one of the missional communities. Maybe another ministry in the church. Maybe just speak to your friends and family and work colleagues about Jesus. Are we ready to accept God's invitation? Is there anything we need to sort out first? Don't use that as an excuse to put off God's invitation. Do we feel unclean? Confess your faults to God and forgiveness is freely available through Jesus Christ. Let's stand if we're able and pray together. You might find it helpful to hold out your hands or raise up your hands to him as we pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, Jesus, our brother and saviour, Holy Spirit, comforter, we worship you. You are holy, holy, holy. All glory, honour, praise and worship to you alone. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you want to establish your kingdom to fulfill your will through us in the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, tell us what you want us to do. Let us hear your invitation, your call on our lives. We will go. Let's just listen. Do we hear God calling us Father, we bring to you all our uncleanliness, our faults, our sins. Though our sins are like scarlet, wash us to be white as snow through your Son, Jesus. Transform us into the people you want us to be, for you are holy, holy, holy. Let's go back to the heart of worship. Amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth. That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear I'm looking into my heart Coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made But it's all about you It's all about you
king of endless worlds No one could express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to heart of worship but it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made but it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm coming back to the heart I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made But it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus It's all about you It's all about you And I will build my life upon your love It is the firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone And I will not Let's build our life I sing that one more time. I will build my life. I will build my life upon your love. It is the firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Oh, It's great to dig into the book of Isaiah and to, to go deep and to go to those places of challenge, isn't it? 
and to see what God is doing in our lives. And he's so for us and so wants the very best for us. Let's keep pressing in. Let's keep reading through these chapters. Let's allow the truth of what, who God is, who Jesus is for us, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives continue to sanctify us, to make us holy, to rejoice in that, and to allow him to send us, to send us as he will. Let us lay our lives down before him. Let us be living sacrifices. And let us close our our service this morning by saying these words, which are all about living for him in this way. Father God, as you lead us out onto our front lines, help us to love you, each other, and our communities. Release the gifts you've given us and invite others to meet with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Have really good weeks. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep digging. Let's go after Jesus. Have great Father's Days, those of you who are celebrating them. May you know God's peace.